how's the microphone? Thank you. All right, so um, this is similar to the, uh, the presentation that I, I gave in Ottawa two months ago. Hopefully I remember what I said then and can add, uh, add something to that. Um, as you heard, uh, I started doing my uh, online Masters of Business Analytics at Quinnipiac uh, in the fall, and I thought that was a good opportunity to reach out to the coaching staff there that has had a good Division One team for the past few years, and uh, Coach Rand Pecknold there was certainly willing to uh, listen to any insights that I had, and so um, over the course of the season, I've been tracking various stats there, and whenever I've had anything interesting, I'm passing that along. So um, it's given me a good chance to look at a different league after having immersed myself a lot in the NHL, not just in the NHL uh, since 2009 when I started writing for Hockey Prospectus. So um, let me give you some of the insights that I got from some of the stats that I tracked. Not the right button. What should I be pushing here? Scroll down. I tried that. Okay, here we go. Okay, there we go. Except it's not very good. Okay, so. Um, I tracked two different sets of stats uh, this year. I, I tracked, uh, of course, the in possession re related stuff uh, at the end of the year, but this is the first two thirds of the season. I, I tracked uh, zone entry and zone entry defense stats uh, from 21 games. And I, I looked, uh, first we're going to look at zone entry defense, and I looked at it both on an individual and a pairing level. So, I've got some, um, some generic uh, labels there at the bottom to show um, how defensemen did overall at zone entry defense. And zone entry defense, basically what I was defining it as is uh, the opponent is coming at that defender, um, depending on whether he's trying to do a controlled entry, uh, a pass, a, a dump in, does that succeed in getting possession for the other other team or not and um, the average level of success of stopping the opponent for uh, the Quinnipiac defenders was 66 percent um, if you look at the right hand side there you can see that there's two def defenders that did quite well defender seven and defender eight so you might if you were looking on this level uh, decide that those are your two best defenders but um, the eye test made me wonder if, uh, if that was actually the case. So I'm going to look at the same data there, but I'm now labeling who's, uh, who's a left side defender and who's a right side defender. Um, and you'll notice that the two guys that did the best were both, uh, right defensemen. And in the defensive scheme that they have there, uh, the two defenders have different roles. So the, the left defender tends to drop back, and he's the one that's dropping back and, and usually looking for the dump in. So um, the two defenders play different roles, so uh, you can't really compare the right D and the left D stats um, apples to apples. So what I, I kind of realized from that and this is that Really what you wanted to be looking at were defense pairings to see which defense pairings did well. And these are all the defense pairings that played a, a certain, uh, had a certain minimum amount of, uh, of entry attempts against them. Obviously some, some of the pairings are gonna have had larger samples than others. But basically if you look over on the second from the right and the, is it's a six from the right. You can see that um, you had pairings with uh, left defenseman two and right defenseman four and left defenseman two and right defenseman five. And um, 
The left defenseman too is, is um, uh, Devin Taze, who's uh, drafted by the Islanders. And he's, he's a good two-way puck moving defenseman. And so um, I think you're seeing the success of, of those two pairings it is really a lot of it. it it's, not that the, it's not that the right defenseman is playing poorly, but you're seeing an effect of the uh, of the other defenseman there as well. So I've I've looked on a limited level afterwards um, about zone entry defense uh, on the NHL level, and uh, I just started from the point of just starting with pairings because I know there was some work. Um, I was asking Eric Yost here just to. Uh, help me remember, but, uh, this was, a, was, uh, something that's been written about on broad street hockey. I know uh, a year or two, something ago, and they found that Braden Coburn was, uh, was very good at zoning entry defense. However, they're, they're defining it there. Um, again, from my findings, I, I, I think you got to look at least pairings, if not more groups of players than that. And I think it's, I don't think it's enough to look at an individual defenseman. Okay, so let's look on a team level here. So the three components of stopping an opponent's possession in, into the, uh, their offensive zone would be um, forcing dump-ins, defending against control entries, and defending against dump-ins. So, I, I looked at um, those three components and saw how the individual defenders, the pairings, and the team overall did um, at each one of those um, factors from game to game. So you can look at this is their first uh, – uh, it's the first 21 games minus a game or two where the I wasn't able to attend and the video was really bad. Um, but basically you can see, for instance – that uh, this was the first factor. They're trying to uh, get the other team to dump in. Uh, the lowest game there is the first of a back-to-back -back against Massachusetts, which was a low-ranked team that upset Quinnipiac that day. So I would um, chalk up part of that loss to being um, uh, poor at forcing them to, uh, to, to dump the puck that game. Uh, the next factor would be stopping controlled entries, standing the other team up at the blue line. Um, the interesting one here is if you look towards the right, the first St. Cloud game. Um, these are these are pretty much the farthest away games that Quinnipiac played the, uh, in Minnesota, but this is on an Olympic ice sheet. So all of a sudden, you throw out the rules for what you're used to, and the team clearly couldn't defend the the, the line at all. Um, in that game, they did a great job of readjusting. You'll see the next game, they, they did much better and they actually dominated that game. But um, when they lost in the ECAC semifinals, uh, that was in Lake Placid, Olympic size ice again, and about two months, two plus months since this game. So, uh, frankly, I think it's. Uh, I don't know. It, it seems like it's, it seems weird to be all of a sudden playing and you get best four teams to play in the, in the conference uh, semifinals and all of a sudden you sort of change the rules by the by the ice sheet that you play on. I'd almost suggest that uh, teams in that kind of situation, not just practice ahead of time, but but maybe even have um, uh, inter squad scrimmages, something to, to get them more used to, to really. Uh, playing on that kind of surface. Um, and then the, the third um, way to stop zone entries would, would be to, um, to retrieve uh, the dumps faster than the other team uh, got to them. And we can look at how the team did overall, and you see that they were, um, they were trending upward over the first uh, two thirds of the season on, on how their zone entry defense was doing. So one interesting thing I did with that, this was just take the three components of zone entry defense, and I just did a regression. 
with those components to see if just based on the components of zone entry defense, obviously you're taking out power play effectiveness and how the goalie did uh, to see how you could um, predict how many goals against the team would have just by these zone uh, entry D uh, statistics on a, on a team level. Um, one game that uh, I, I would point out is the fourth game there against Connecticut, another lower ranked team. Um, I think they had some bad bounces, the, the goalie was hot and so on, but you could look at this and say, um, by these stats, I would have expected only two point, them to only give up 2.1 goals and they ended up giving up four goals. So this, this was uh, a game that went against the run of stats in that regard. <laughs> Last section here, I also looked at zone entries on offense. So looking at, thinking about the work that's been done generally with, with um, zone entries, uh, obviously people like Eric Tulski, uh, Corey Schneider, who's here, um, lots of others. It's generally been the same split that I had when I was looking on the defensive side. Uh, is it a controlled entry or an uncontrolled entry? Is it a carry or a dump, basically? I, I ended up splitting into three categories because I thought that um, there was maybe more to be seen here. So on the controlled side, I split it up into carries and passes. So what, how I like to think about this is, and I'm sure other people, when they track, they define it their own ways. I say that the puck carrier is in the point guard position. If you think of a basketball point guard, what's he going to do? Is he going to dribble? Is he going to shoot? Is he going to pass? He's got three options and the same, same kind of options exist for the puck carrier as he's approaching the blue line. So looking at this, I saw there's a difference if you've got a carry and if you got a pass. So if you're looking on the average of all the players, for instance, you got a 67% success rate um, when you're carrying the puck. On the other hand, when the, pa when it, when the puck was passed in, I found that there's a 53% success rate. And um, I have a key here that I didn't have in the other presentation that shows some of their um, top line players. But if you look over on the right side, um, the first and second line centermen and the second line uh, of, I'm sorry, the second line right wing. I mean, they're, those, are, those are probably the three uh, key possession forwards and they all did very well by this, this past stat. Just I won't mention much about the uh, dumps, other than what we know in that they're a lot less successful than the uh, than the controlled entries. And overall, and this is this is in addition to what I showed before in in Ottawa. I can get this. Um, You can see that uh, again. I, I added the, the the player the player names there. So the 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 three players off to the right there, as far as um, overall success rate, um, Travis uh, St. Dennis, uh, Matthew Pekka, who's a uh, Tampa draft pick who's playing in Syracuse now, and uh, and Sam Annis, who's the first line left wing. They're the best uh, possession uh, players for the team. Uh, I would say overall, at least uh, offensively, and uh, they're, they're the three that showed up the best by the by the zone entries. Um, I also put up the how they did by Corsi when I, I tracked that for the last third of the season, and um, I guess you'd say at least for St. Dennis, who came in first by Corsi, um, he was also first at uh, at the at the zone entries. So uh, that certainly correlated. Uh, on the other hand, you can look. Um, if you look at the second line right wing, who's Landon Smith, he's a freshman who had a great year scoring, uh, particularly on the power play. But you might look at him as more of a passenger on that second line uh, because uh, even though he came in second uh, Corsi rating as, uh, among the forwards, he was, uh, he was well down as far as, uh, as creating entries himself. So... Um, kind of checking different stats against each other when you're looking at, um, okay, somebody has a good Corsi rating 
but now we dig into another stat to say maybe at least on on this uh, level he was more of a passenger as far as as the team getting possession in the zone and you'll notice that the what's the average uh, average success rate here overall was 47 percent and we'll just take a glance at, at how it was on the power play average zone entry uh, success rate on the power play was uh, 73 percent which makes sense because obviously it should be a lot easier to get into the zone on the power play and it mystifies me when teams <laughs> at any level uh, NHL, AHL, college um, do dump ins on the power play other than once in a blue moon to throw the other team off. Um, that was it. A bunch of different uh, different observations, and I'd be happy to take your questions uh, later on when there's time.